In 2001, weeks after the attacks on New York City and on Washington, and frankly, the attacks on all of us, attacks that perpetrated, and they were perpetrated, by the Islamic fundamentalists, Mayor Rudy Giuliani visited Israel to show solidarity with terror victims. I sent my plane because I backed the mission for Israel 100 percent. I went down to the scene, and we set up uh, headquarters at 75 Barclay Street, which was right there with the police commissioner, the fire commissioner, mm -hmm. the head of emergency management. And we were operating out of there when we were told that the World Trade Center was going to collapse. And it did collapse before we could actually get out of the building. So we were trapped in the building for 10, 15 minutes and finally found an exit and got out, walked north, and took a lot of people with us. Giuliani, in his own words, has admitted that he was warned that the World Trade Center was going to collapse. This despite the fact that there was no possible way for this to be predicted in the first hour of the unfolding disaster. Even more incredibly, despite being given this warning, no effort was made to pass it on to the police, firefighters, and other responders who were still working in and around the buildings. I remember getting a call from the uh, fire department commander telling me that they were not sure they were going to be able to contain the fire. And I said, you know, we've had such terrible loss of life. Maybe the smartest thing to do is, is pull it. Uh, and they made that decision to pull. And then we watched the building collapse. I mean, you look at Larry Silverstein, who's a terrific owner in New York and a very good friend of mine who I just called. I was very worried about him because I assume maybe he was in the building. He took possession of the building one week ago. As you know, he just bought the World Trade Center. Right. Um, a lot of people ask, uh, how is it possible that um, a Boeing plane would be able to destroy the, or two planes would be able to destroy the Twin Towers? Because they were constructed to withstand like a 707 attack. Well, it's tremendous power and tremendous heat. And people were willing to die, and uh, when they're willing to die, and when they're willing to become kamikazes of a sense, uh, there's very little you can do about it. I mean, the, the heat and the power, actually it was amazing that the, the initial jolts didn't jar the building as much as people would have thought. But the, the tremendous amounts of fuel that was dumped on the building and 1,600 degrees temperature, I guess that's probably more than anything could take, no matter what. Will you be involved? Will you take any efforts, any steps to reconstruct the area? Well, I have a lot of men down here right now. We have over 100, and we have about 125 coming. So we'll have a couple of hundred people down here. And they're very brave, and what they're doing is amazing. And uh, we will be involved in some form in helping to reconstruct. The building is going to contain not two million feet, but a million seven. And that's one of the sacrifices we have to make. I said, let's make it and let's get on with it. And so, next thing you know, we've got the designs of a building. And the first design meeting was in April of 2000. And construction began shortly thereafter in 2002. The developer is actually a friend of mine, but he didn't want to build this building either. If you look back at the records, I mean, when it was first foistered upon him, Larry Silverstein is a great guy, he's a good guy, he's a friend of mine, but he didn't want to build this pile of junk. And it's a shame. It's really a shame. Now that you have Donald Trump and possibly Larry Silverstein, who is the developer who owns the lease to, to Lower Manhattan, when you have that group saying it's time to rebuild the Twin Towers and reclaim New York's skyline, there's a certain momentum that most politicians will likely get behind. In, in the year 2000, Donald, you considered running for president. If, if, if you had done that and if you had been successful, what do you think uh, you'd be doing right now? Well, I, I'd be taking a very, very tough line, Alan. I mean, uh, you know, most people feel they know uh, uh, at least approximately the group of people that did this and where they are. But, um, boy, would you have to take a hard line on this. This just can't be tolerated, and it's got to be very, very stern. This is, as you and I were discussing before, Alan, this was 
probably worse than Pearl Harbor. Many more people are dead. And, and this country is different today, and, and it's going to be different than it ever was for many years to come. The document was effectively a charter of the project for a new American century, a neoconservative think tank in Washington. The founding members included Donald Rumsfeld, Dick Cheney, uh, Wolfowitz, Paul Wolfowitz of the Defense Department, uh, Richard Pearl, head of the uh, Defense Advisory Board, um, Louis Libby, Cheney's chief of staff, uh, very, uh, John Bolton, Under Secretary of State for uh, Arms Control, uh, Ellie Cohen, uh, who's on the Defense Policy Board. Much of what these men wanted is coming true. They urged that the U.S. abandon the anti-ballistic missile treaty. It has. They wanted establishment of more permanent U.S. military bases abroad. That is happening in the Philippines and in Georgia and will likely happen in Iraq. They urged regime change as a goal of foreign wars, not just in Iraq. They wanted the U.S. as a global constabulary, their word, unburdened by the U.N. or world opinion, preventing any challenge to U.S. dominance. But, they wrote, a year before September 11th, such aspirations are unlikely to be realized without a catastrophic and catalyzing event, like a new Pearl Harbor. What we need to stand up and say is not only did they attack the U.S.'s liberty, they did 9-11. They didn't. I have had long conversations over the past two weeks with contacts at the Army War College, at the headquarters Marine Corps, and I've made it absolutely clear in both cases that it is 100% certain that 9-11 was a Mossad operation, period. First, the disbelief. And what I show them immediately afterwards is an interview with a demolitions expert named Danny Joenko, and it shows the third building at the World Trade Center going down. And they look at that, and I said, now you understand that if one of the buildings was wired for demolition, all of them were wired for right. demolition. And that's it. That's the tipping point. Getting into arguments about who was flying what and where they were and whether there was nanothermite, those things are true, but they're incidental. The thing that's necessary is to tell people three buildings went down, the third was not hit by a plane, it was wired for controlled demolition, therefore all of them were wired for controlled demolition, and at that point the reaction is rage. First disbelief and then rage. 9-11 has led directly to 60,000 Americans dead and wounded. God knows how many hundreds of thousands of people in other countries that we've killed or wounded or made homeless. This is an open wound. And what Americans need to understand is they did it. They did it. And if they do understand that, Israel's going to disappear. Israel will flat-ass disappear from this earth. I sent a film to one of my colleagues, and it basically had Americans grieving over their dead coming back. And I showed one of them, it was a woman just wrenched by grief, you know, over over her dead soldier. And I said, you know, if Americans ever know, ever know that Israel did this, they're going to scrub them off the earth and they're not going to give a rat's ass what the cost is. They are not going to care. The first thing marked is astonishment. They didn't know. They, they truly didn't know. And these are not unintelligent people. They really didn't no. And the next statement is rage. Real rage. The Zionists are playing this as truly an all or nothing exercise. Because if they lose this one, if the American people ever realize what happened, they're done. The military has not been bought. The military is loyal, but it has not been bought. And if it ever understands this, really, really deeply understands this, and this is what I got when I put some of these things to the Army War College and to Headquarters Marine Corps, I mentioned to a contact at Headquarters Marine Corps, I said, you know they did 9-11. And it was, you don't mean it. I said, absolutely. And if they ever understand that, these people are history. Completely shocked. Unbelievable. 
Right, that's the view from the Palestinian side. Joining me now here in the BBC World Studio is the former Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak, uh, who's in London at the moment. Mr Barak, welcome to BBC World. First, your reaction, having heard what's happened. At least four planes have been hijacked and uh, there may be more. The world will not be the same from today on. I don't know who is responsible. I believe we will know in 12 hours. Uh, ben Laden sits in Afghanistan. There is a source but of terror. who else terror. you identify there? Uh, because we're not saying he's responsible for this necessarily. No, no, we, we don't say that he's responsible. Every simple step, crossing borders or going on a plane or, or on a, a ship, will become more complicated. It's a time to launch a, a operational, concrete war against uh, uh, terror, even if it takes certain pains from the routine activities of our normal society. This is the time to deploy a globally concerted effort led by the United States, the UK, Europe and Russia against all sources of terror. Consistently, along six or ten years, Iran, Iraq, Libya, North Korea, this is the only way without this clarity of purpose there will be no world order, no world order possible.